It's good to see y'all this evening. Um, I had a, a thought, and I don't, I really, we don't know um, how things worked in the New Testament churches. There's, some, uh, there's things that we know that there's an awful lot we don't know. I was thinking this afternoon about the, uh, as that church exploded, as it turned from 120 people praying in the, in the room to 5,000 being saved, and um, we find out that the church is, is growing by leaps and bounds, and they're meeting in each other's homes, and they're, um, they're studying scripture together. And I, I was thinking about what that conversation, those conversations might have been look like, about James and John getting together for, for supper and saying, so how'd your day go? You know, there's some priests that are really close. I've been talking to them, and they seem really convinced. And, and John said, yeah, I had a good day, too. We went down to the temple, and there was the sick guy, and we helped him. And, and th there was a continual working of that, I'm sure. Obviously, the working of the Holy Spirit. But also, and through that, the working of God's people. And I won't go into all the details, but today is one of those days as I come to church this evening that I am thankful. I feel like that. This is a chance for us to gather and say, well, how was this afternoon? Okay, there was this thing that was happening. That was good. And then there was, there was this. And, and ministry was happening not just during Sunday school, not just during church, not just during the, the meal after church, not just at the 5 o'clock hour and not now, but throughout the day. And I'm excited about that as a church. Um, because what we want to be doing, what we're about to start doing again, is praising our Savior. And one way we do that is the living of our lives with others, sharing with others' burdens, um, caring about others, walking through life together with others and understanding the good and the bad and loving each other. So I'm thankful for you as a church. I'm thank you, thankful for the ministry that God is doing in you. And may we continue to serve him that way. Um, I want to mention before we pray two prayer requests. One of them is... Um, Roy and Teresa called Patrick this afternoon. He called me and said just that they had a, a special unspoken prayer request. So I, I, won't, I won't say exactly what it is. Just um, I want to spend a minute as we begin here praying for Roy and Teresa and their family. Um, and the other one is, uh, same thing, I'm not going to tell you a whole lot of detail, but um, I got a, a text from my dad this afternoon saying that my, my uncle, we need to be praying for my uncle. So that, that's, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and let's do this. We don't have to stand up or anything, but those of you that have a prayer request that you've been praying for, an unspoken prayer request, will you raise your hand? And just kind of glance around, because what we're going to do, we'll, we'll take a quiet minute in prayer. That, that What I want you all to do is you look around, and you see a couple people that you can pray for. You all raise your hands again so people can see. Okay? We'll take just a, a minute quietly to pray for those, those needs. And then I'll finish that time in prayer and we'll, we'll, we'll move to the next part of our worship. Let's pray. Lord God, we're here tonight to worship you. We thank you that we have that privilege that you've made a way that you would even 
<laughs> choose to listen to us. In your righteousness and holiness, you've, you've brought us to yourself so that we can even come before you. We thank you for that, Lord. And as we uh, continue in this time of worship, Lord, we, we've come this evening worshiping you by loving your people. And I pray for, Lord, the ones that, that have these unspoken prayer requests that are, um, for whatever reason, the things that we can't share with each other yet or right now, that you would bring these needs to our minds as a congregation, that we would, we would care for each other, that we would love and serve each other. And Lord, we, we know that there's a lot of actions we could do maybe some things that would be helpful. But we also know, Lord, that we have the privilege of coming before you and that you can do all things. So we come to you asking for your hand that you would glorify your name, that you would draw people to yourself, that you would heal our our physical problems and also that you would you would heal our spiritual problems and now as we sing Lord I pray that our our minds and our hearts and our voices will be um, in tune with each other and in tune with you glorifying your great name for what you've done for us and it's in Jesus name we pray amen you to sing along with us it's a little course that we go it's up on the screen let's all stand and sing it together seek ye first seek ye first <clears throat> First time you heard that. Okay. Let, for you all, let's sing it again. Here we're going together. Here we go. Sing
Since Jesus came into my heart, number 441. <laughs> I mean, it's been a while since I've sung Happy Day. The words to that song are so rich. As y'all were, as I hope y'all were, y'all were thinking about those words as you were singing them. Man, what a, what a rich treasure of reminders we can have of the happy day that we have to look forward to. Now turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to get all the way up through, by the way, I'll, just as a reminder, um, we're going to get all the way up to and then not quite the fruit of the Spirit tonight. So uh, the next time we meet, we will go through that. But just as a reminder, we will not be meeting here next Sunday night. It's homecoming in the morning, and so we're going to have a time of um, visitation by phone in the evening. So we, we will not um, have church on Sunday night next week. So, um, Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 18, and then we'll go back and, and talk about the verses one by one. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. 
I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who would unsettle, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come this evening to study your word and to dwell on what you inspired Paul to warn the Galatians about, and, and through that inspiration you, you turn the spotlight back on ourselves and warn us that we would not be caught up in trying to earn our salvation. I pray for your blessing tonight that your words would be living and active in my heart and in the hearts of all of us who are here, that we would respond in faith to what it is that you would teach us. Be glorified and lifted up. Be exalted in us. And, and Lord, we, we, we love you, and we are so thankful that you, you gave us your word so that we can know what it is you want us to do and how it is you want us to live. Bless this time, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For freedom, Christ has set us free. What wonderful words. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful claim of what it is that God has done for us. The reason Christ set us free was so that we would be free. And I know that sounds obvious, but the reason Paul's saying it is what he's been saying through this whole book. The Galatians had fallen away. They started to think that Christ set them free to an extent, and then they had to be Jews. And Paul's saying, Did, I think you're missing the whole point. You've been set free. You've been set free. <laughs> For freedom you have been set free. And I really like the way the King James says this. Stand firm there. In ESV it says, stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Okay, kids, in case you're not familiar with what a yoke is. Okay? If you have animals and you want them to pull your plow, or whatever it is you want them to pull, you got to find some way to hook the animal up to the plow. Okay? So with an ox, for instance, they would take a big piece of wood that was the yoke, and they would put it on the ox's neck and kind of right in front of its shoulders. And then they would put something underneath to kind of hold it there. And then they would attach that yoke back to the plow or whatever it is they're pulling. And that way, when the yoke, when the, when the ox pulled forward, it was a way for him to pull the plow through the ground. That's what a yoke is. Okay? And what, what Paul has been telling us is the gospel of Christ, the good news about what Jesus did for us, is that we were stuck having to pull our own sins. We were bound by the yoke of our sin. And so Christ came and he took the yoke off of us. Matter of fact, what he did is he took the yoke instead of us. 
and he pulled our sins that we couldn't pull. That's the picture. And so we have been freed from our yoke of sin. And Paul's been doing quite a bit of explanation to explain to us that one of the ways we had this yoke on our shoulders, well, it was always there. But the law had the effect of teaching us that we were bound by our sin. So the law pointed out to us that we were carrying our yoke so that we would know we can't pull it. And then we would call out to Jesus and he would say, okay, I'll pull it. And he would free us from our yoke and he would put his, he would take our yoke and he would bear it. So we've been free. And so what Paul's saying is, you have been freed. Don't get back under the yoke. You're not in it anymore. The way the King James says it, is do not be entangled with the yoke of bondage. You see, because once an animal gets in the yoke and there's all the wire, all the, the chains and the wood and everything holding it together, it's stuck. It's captured by the yoke. And Paul's saying, look, Christ came to get you out of the yoke, and he did that. You're not in the yoke anymore. So why are you getting back in the yoke? Don't. Stop it. Stand firm about this circumcision issue. Do not submit about circumcision because if you do, you, you, you're like an ox that's been taken out of the yoke and all of a sudden the ox walks back underneath the yoke and gets back in it. Why would you do that? Don't submit again. Don't become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 2. Look, I say. I'm sorry. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. All right, we're going to have to get a little bit uncomfortable. It's Sunday night. We're going to have to get just a little bit uncomfortable. Because we know what these words mean. I'm trying to decide how... Is Paul saying that men who have been circumcised cannot be saved? And there might be some of you, there might be a lot of you out there who say, well, I sure hope not. What is he saying here? Why is he, what he's saying is, if you Galatians accept circumcision, then you have to keep the whole law. I mean, that seems plain English. We ought to be able to, you know, that, that is clearly what it is that he's saying. What does he mean? See, here's what had happened. Let's go back to the initiation of circumcision. When God came to Abraham, he told Abraham that this would be a sign that if you believe me, I know you don't have a son yet, but if you believe that I will do what I said I will do, then you walk before me blamelessly. Remember that? And so therefore, the sign of circumcision is a sign of Abraham trusting God. That's what the image was supposed to be. But the Jews took that image and broke it. Now, that's not uncommon. I, I can think of at least two others in our day that we've watched that. And not to be too politically uncorrect or to go seeking people I can kick. But for instance, we like to read older books in our house. Um, even books from early 1900s. The kids really like, for instance, The Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew and those types of books. If you read books from the 30s, 40s, 50s, there's a word that often comes up that in our ears sounds shocking. Three letters, G-A-Y. 
After a fun day, it was a really gay day. Right? And yet now, man, that's hard for me to even, I almost feel like I'm saying a not so good word. Why? Because that word got turned to mean something different than it meant 50 years ago. It just did. We can talk about good or bad or whatever, but the bottom line is it just did. It used to be that if a child came, went somewhere wearing a rainbow on their shirt, you would think, that's cute, there's a rainbow on her shirt. And now, that doesn't mean that anymore. Right? So we have, and I, I'm only bringing that up, I'm not attacking anything, I'm just making this, the point that y'all are aware in your own lifetime, you have watched what something used to mean start to mean something else. And over the thousands of years of Judaism, what started out as a God-given image, God gave Abraham an image, a physical way to, uh, to accept faith in him. You can almost think about it as a baptism. Now, be careful, I need to say that carefully. I'm not claiming that the Old Testament circumcision is identical to the New Te Testament water baptism, but there are some connections. There are some, some things. It was a way for someone who wanted to be obedient to God, to trust God. It was a way for them to demonstrate their trust for God. And what they did is they cut off a piece of themselves. It was painful, and it was sacrificial. They cut off piece of themselves. What it became was an earning of the goodness of God and a status symbol. I don't know how. Matter of fact, this is really, God is so amazing with his pictures. The picture he gave for Old Testament circumcision is not something that you would be able to walk down the street and say, okay, that's one and that's one and that's not one, right? You couldn't do that. And in the same way, when God saves us, there's not this big glowing sign over our head that says, redeemed, redeemed, not yet. God's amazing in the pictures that he does and how consistent he is with these things. But this picture of circumcision that he gave the, the Israelite people to do was supposed to be showing their faith in God, that they were getting rid of their flesh and that they were trusting in him. And instead, the Jews turned that into, this is my action that I do. And somehow they thought that because Abraham circumcised himself, that was why... Sarah got pregnant. No. How, no. <laughs> That's not at all why Sarah got pregnant, but they missed the mark. So the picture of circumcision in the minds of Jewish believers got twisted and turned around the wrong way. And what Paul's saying is, you guys have a bad picture in your mind with what circumcision is. And if you fall into this, if you start circumcising yourself because you want to be a Christian, you have so missed the mark. If you're going to do that, then you better live like a Jew the rest of the way because it's not... Grace plus works, it's grace alone, and that's it. And if you try to live under works, then you have to live all the way under works. That's what he's saying. That is how we get entangled back under the yoke of slavery. Is we say, okay, well, you know, God's freed me from the law, but, yeah, there's a couple things that I will not... Um, that I, that I better do to please God. So I've been saved, but this thing right here, if I don't do this, then I'll be condemned again. So I better do this. No. No, we're either saved by grace through faith entirely, or we're saved by our own actions and the works of the law entirely, and you better hope it's not the second, because nobody but Christ ever succeeded in that. Verse 4. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. I, I, sorry, I need to go back. That, that circumcision passage, 
There are some today that might say it is not a good idea to circumcise your children. Don't do that. This is telling us very clearly, don't do that. And I would caution you, I'm not going to say it's wrong not to circumcise your children, and it's not wrong to circumcise your children. What this passage is saying is circumcision has nothing to do with salvation, period. It just doesn't. That's the point. The Galatians had so gotten entangled that for them, they were doing it as an act of trying to earn their salvation. Okay, just... Verse 4, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision, he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. What is grace? For through the Spirit, by faith, we, eagerly, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. There's a lot of words here, a lot of kind of Christianese. The grace of God that he's warning us, if we go back to being circumcised, we're going to, in verse 4, we're going to fall away from grace. Well, what is that grace of God? That grace of God is the hope of righteousness that we are eagerly waiting for. Not that we become righteousness because of our good things, but that he makes us righteous through him. And that hope of righteousness is given by faith, and here's a key word, given by faith through the Spirit. So the Spirit of God helps us have the faith to hope in the righteousness that God would provide in us. Not us earning our own salvation, but instead we're being given, to, given that salvation by God. So then what are works? Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. One of the commentators talked about Christ's economy. If you're going to live in Christ's kingdom, in Christ's world, you better find out what Christ wants you to do. And in Jesus, in Jesus Christ's economy, works have no worth. They're not... They don't make you higher in Christ's esteem or lower. Circumcision is just circumcision. That's it. What does matter is faith working through love. That's an interesting phrase. In Christ's economy, in Jesus Christ, there is only faith working through love. Hmm. I see this two ways. On the one hand, we are able to have faith because of what Jesus did. And what Jesus did, he did because of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the love that God had for us to provide us a means by faith that we could come to him. Okay? So on the one hand, our faith is an overpouring of God's love. God, in, because of his love for us, gave us what we need to be able to have faith in him. The other understanding of this is how we live our life. What Paul's doing is, and, and you know this, you know that I'm not going to finish this sermon without turning around and saying, okay, now how you live does matter. I hope you know that. <laughs> but we're going to understand that the life we live to God happens as an overflow of our love and not as a requirement for us to earn our way to heaven. I am not, Paul never tells us that the believer has no works. James says that faith without works is what? Dead. So yes, faith and works are together, but we have to understand which comes first. And in God's, in Christ's economy, works count for nothing. Faith is everything. And so what we see overflowing is the overflow of our love because of our faith. 
Let's go to a very simple, it might even be, and again, kind of similar to circumcision, baptism. We are baptized because Christ was baptized and he told us we ought to. Okay? I believe that one of the biggest reasons Jesus gave us baptism was to give us something easy to do. Kind of like Naaman. Remember Naaman was full of leprosy? He went to see Elisha, and, he, and Elisha said, okay, go down the Jordan River, bathe seven times, and you'll be... And, and, and Naaman said, what? I wanted something hard. I wanted something that took work. He was a mighty commander of the armies. He's someone who could do things. No. It's not the things you do. You just go down to the water and you take a bath. And he goes so far as to say, I come from a place with a lot of cleaner rivers than this place. Why, why was it important? The action wasn't important. It was the faith that was important. And in the same way, when we are um, being obedient to the Lord in baptism, we're having a chance to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I have faith in you. And so because I believe in you and I have faith in you, I love you enough to do what you've asked me to do. That water is not special. That action doesn't save us. But our hearts... can be seen when we decide to obey the Lord through our love for him, not to earn our salvation, but as an overflowing of our faith in love. That's what I think he's saying in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Verse 7. You are running so well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Now Paul is, is good at this. He likes to switch images, and he does it quickly. So he does it several times, just in these couple verses I just read. First we were talking about the yoke of slavery, right? Like the ox that has a yoke on its shoulder and it's pulling. And then he says, he flips around to a race. And, and the image now is that as a Christian, we're on a race. We're running for the Lord. We're doing what God has called. You can almost think about it as God the, the Father is standing at the end of the road and we as the prodigal son are running to him. Here we go, we're coming. And it's not a race as in I'm looking to the side to see who I can get ahead of. It's a race of I want to get there as fast as I possibly can. So I'm running. And the picture Paul says is you were doing such a good job. You were running. Arms open, waiting for Jesus, for Jesus to receive you. You're going after it. And all of a sudden, someone tripped you. I want to know, who was it that hindered you? Why are you stumbling? And then immediately he switches to another picture. And he says, you've got a loaf of bread. And you need to put in some yeast. Well, it turns out just a little bit of yeast is all you need because you mix it around in the bread, and what happens? It invisibly moves through the whole bread. And I am not a baker, so anytime we start talking about food analogies, I'm speaking from what others have told me, not from my personal experience. But as I understand it, you put a little yeast in the bread and leave it for a minute, you can hang it up trying to get that yeast back out of it. Once it starts its work, it's in there. Just a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. And this is what Paul's saying, be careful. Galatians. You think this is starting with just an issue of circumcision? This thing is going to explode on you. If you allow the works of the law to control you in this one aspect, before long you're going to be full-blown Pharisee. That's one thing he's saying. 
And the other thing he's saying is that if you've got a bad teacher there who's causing you to stumble, you need to, that man needs to stop that. I think he's even going so far as to say, you need to get that guy out of there. Because a little leaven will ruin the whole lump. Doesn't take much. Be careful about deception. So how do we know? How do we as, um, as believers, and I hope um, someone came up to me this, this morning and there was, a, there was a difference in translation, the verse that I read and their Bible. And they came up to me and said, okay, I want to make sure, did you misspeak when you read that? Or does your Bible say something different than my Bible? Do you know how thankful I am for that? It is definitely still part of the church's body to be listening in light of the Scripture. And Paul even gives us a clue here. What he says is, um, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. The warning is to us, church, that everything that's said, whether it's my words or whether it's Gabe's words next Sunday night, Sunday morning, or anybody else's words, Sunday school, no matter where it is, that what you're doing is you're taking what you're hearing and you line it up with the words of him who called us. Everything goes back to what did Christ say. Everything. And that's how we find deception. And if the Galatians had done that, they would have recognized that this whole idea is not what Jesus was teaching. This was not from him who calls us. And then he also goes on to say that he is confident that the, um, in the Lord that you will take no other view and that the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Those are strong words. He does not say that the church will make him bear the penalty. I think he's leaving it to the justice of God. God will make it right. Okay, verse 11. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Strong language. Now, we're talking about the economy of Christ and how in the economy of Christ, faith matters, works does not. In the economy of the world, works are pretty important. Paul makes a claim here that it's worth us just thinking about for a second, and it's this. Paul says that if I had not told the Jews that you don't need to be circumcised, the Jews would have been okay with Christianity. He said, the reason the Jews are after me is because I insist that circumcision is not how salvation occurs. We live in a culture that would not tell you they're against Christianity. Downtown Knoxville, there's a huge sign up right now that says, Coexist. One of the images on the Coexist sign, the T, is what? A cross. And what are they saying? Let's all just get along. They're not ups they would say, we're not upset with Christianity. Let's just all be on the same page. Why can't we just agree? But there's a problem. You know what their problem is? They're not willing to admit that only Jesus saves. That is the exact same problem that the Jews had. The Jews, sure, okay, if Jesus is a prophet, there's lots of famous prophets. There are famous rabbis that are quoted still today that were before Jesus' time. The Jews would have had no problem allowing Jesus to become another rabbi, another Hillel. 
That's not, that's not what Jesus did, though. What Jesus said is, the only way you can be saved is through me. That's the problem. And so, in today's world, we find the same way. The persecution that comes against Christianity comes every time we say Christ is the only way. You drop that one word, only, and you'll be hard-pressed to find any um, religious group in the United States that's against us right now. Whether it stays that way, we'll see. But for now, that's the case. What's really happening is every other religion wants a way to save themselves. That's really the problem. And only in Christianity do we finally get to the point where Jesus says, listen, the only way you come to the Father is me taking you there. You cannot get there on your own. And the world bows up at that and says, yes, I can. And that's where the battle lines are drawn. And the funny thing is, this same world that insists on getting to God on their own power is not willing to take it all the way there. Talk to someone sometime who doesn't believe in God. Ask them why it's wrong to lie. And they'll, they'll all say, no, yeah, lying's not a good idea. Except, except I, there is one time where it's okay. Um, when I'm lying, that's okay. When you lie, that's wrong. But when I lie in certain circumstances at certain times, that's okay. Paul's saying, okay, big boy, you want to make your way up to God? Well, then go all the way. And he does it in a very graphic way. And I won't, re I, I mean, y'all know what emasculate means, I hope. If not, come ask me afterwards and I'll tell you whether I'll tell you. <laughs> Some of the younger ones I probably won't tell you. <laughs> but you know what he's saying. If you think you can earn your way to God uh, with this little thing, don't you realize it needs much bigger than that? It's bigger than you can handle. That's what he's saying. And it's funny that the world is going to say, yeah, we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps to get to God. And yet at the same time, they're not willing to recognize just how holy God is and how far they are from getting to him. So Paul points that out. All right, verse 13. So you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. I actually entitled the sermon tonight, Freedom to Love. And if there's one point I hope you walk away with tonight, it's this. That Christ took us out of the bondage that we were stuck in our flesh and our sin and all of the junk that we had. He took us out and he made us free. And what we're supposed to be doing with that freedom is loving. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. Christ has freed us from the penalty of sin so that because we love one another, we can serve one another. And again, it is so tempting to go a little bit further and say, okay, serving one another is how you please God. No. No, you've been free from sin. Now that you've been free from sin, when you, serve, when you love God, you serve one another. And again, the pictures are so wonderful. We'll go into this a lot more detail in two weeks. When you look at a plant, the fruit comes 
at the end of the plan and not at the beginning. So everyone understands that the plant yields the fruit, not the fruit yielding the plant. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit, so that we keep it clear in our heads that the fruit didn't create the plant. The plant is demonstrated by its fruit. It's the other way around. I like to think about it as a gas gauge. The gas gauge is kind of like the works that we do. It might demonstrate something about our heart, but if you run out of gas, you cannot reach into your dashboard and turn the dial up to full and think that means you can drive. The gas gauge is nothing but an indicator about what's in the tank. And in the same way, the works that we do are nothing except an indicator about what's in the tank. They don't save us at all. They're just the fruit at the end of the vine. The whole law. This is so funny. He has been going on and on and on. You are not under the law. You've been freed from the law. You're not under the law. And then he turns around and he says, by the way, now that you're free, the whole law is really just love your neighbor as yourself. He's turning around and saying, look, it's only through Christ that you were able to do it in the first place. Now that you've been freed from it, now you can turn around and do it. Now, some of you might have never gotten to this point. Do you, when you were little and you were learning to read, every word was a battle and every sentence an accomplishment. But there comes a time, at least for some people, when it makes a transition and all of a sudden you get it. And then reading becomes a pleasure and not a chore. Now, if that's not a good example for you, I can guarantee you there's another one. Hitting a baseball. Mowing grass. I mean, I, I can think of a hundred different examples of things that it starts off as at work and you don't like it, and then all of a sudden it clicks and you get it, and now you want to do it. We have been freed from the law by Christ, and now because of Christ, we can fulfill the law, which we never could have done before we were freed from the law. He brings us right back to it. And he says, okay, we've been taken out, we've been taken away from the bondage of our flesh, and now that that's happened, by the way, as you serve one another, as you're loving, you're actually doing the whole law that you couldn't do before, because Christ has freed you. Okay, one more point and we'll be finished tonight. Um, verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There's a contrast here. Are you going to live by the Spirit or are you going to live by the flesh? The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What the law was meant to do was point our minds back to the flesh so that we would be able to see just how driven by our flesh we are. Christ in his love and his kindness and his graciousness to us delivered us from the penalty of the law so that we would be free from its effects. And now we walk not in the law, but in, not in our flesh, but instead by the Spirit. And we're going to talk a lot more about this next time. So I want you to remember that what Paul is not saying is since you've been freed by the law, you can live however in the world you want. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is now that you've been freed by the law, you can love like you were intended to love. And as you love, you will be driven by the Spirit. And we'll talk about next time, the fruits of the Spirit will begin to be manifest in your life. That's my desire. I hope it's yours too. Let's, let's stand and sing.